Um, yep, that's right. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to B-Sites and welcome to track three. So I'll be your first presentation this morning. Um, just as Mark said, I will briefly introduce... Oh, that is tiny. Um, right. Okay. Um, so just to briefly introduce myself. Um, so I'm Vitze. I work at PwC in the Endpoint Threat Detection Team. Um, which means that I help with threat detection, compromise discovery, that sort of thing. We help clients with that. Uh, I'm new to B-Sites, so it's my first time here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's also the first presentation, so no pressure there. Like, what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, so I'm going to talk to you in the next 45 minutes or so about uh, attacker emulation. Um, first, I will just briefly introduce what it is and why you would want to do it. So hopefully those of you who don't do it, I can convince that it's actually a good thing. You should look into it. Uh, then a little bit on the how, like how can you do it? Um, and as you will see, there's a lot of tools available that can help you with these sort of things. And at the end, I will show you some cool stuff. And that's the real reason you're here, right? Like that's the, that's the actual stuff you want to see. Um, so without further ado, let's just start. Um, attack your emulation. So let's get the definition straight uh, right out of the way. So in the broader sense, when we talk about attacker emulation, uh, we talk about the act of doing what an attacker would do. Uh, you know how people sometimes say uh, to, to catch a thief, you have to think like a thief. And I think that very much applies to the cyberspace as well. Um, if you are defending as an individual, as an organization, um, you probably have an idea of who you are defending yourself against, right? Especially if you work for a, for a larger organization, you probably have like threat intelligence, and that should give you a better idea of uh, who your adversaries are and what, what techniques do they use, what are they after, who are they, uh, what vulnerabilities, exploits do they use. Uh, that's a very good start. So as a defender, um, hopefully, you do stuff to make sure that you detect that or even prevent that. And whether that is on an endpoint level or a network level, hopefully you uh, make sure that the two are aligned, right? Uh, the big question is, however, how do you make sure that you are um, that your defenses are effective, uh, really? So if you um, you know who your attacker is, so hopefully you have some defenses in place. But how do you know that you actually will catch them if they try and get into your system? Um, so your threat intelligence might give you um, IOCs, uh, or it might give you behavioral rules. Hopefully, you have uh, stuff in place to detect that. But how can you make sure that you're detecting the right thing? Because um, it's really, ironically, it's really, you can't see what you can't see. So you can, if you detect something, you know that you can detect it. If you miss something, um, then it's too late, really, right? So but by the time you find out about that. So that's why you might want to look into attacker emulation. Um, so as I said, one of the main reasons for us is um, testing your own detection capability. So making sure that you can detect what you're trying to detect. Uh, and as I will show you in a few slides time, there's multiple ways of doing attacker emulation. And um, I think a really good advantage is that you can do it with a realistic attack model. What it will look like, I'll show in a bit. Another reason why you might want to look into it is um, research. So it's, it's sort of like a collateral thing. But I found when I started looking into attacker emulation, that you really have to start thinking like your attacker, which means that you really have to understand the tools they use and the vulnerabilities they use. So rather than just read a report and write a uh, signature on the base of that, you really have to do the exploitation yourself. And that forced me to really think about, like, what am I trying to do here? And that really helped me improve my defenses because I had a way better understanding of what I was doing. So for, from a personal point of view, research, like, it, it really helps you understanding your attacker. And thirdly, not an important, I think, is um, showing off because we all want to, right? So whether you're trying to impress a client or maybe someone in your organization, someone more senior or even board level, um, it is pretty good if you can, in an automated fashion, uh, emulate what an attacker would do and show that what you're doing in terms of defending is actually working, right? So you can actually show whether that's on an endpoint or a network level that you are able to detect your uh, adversary. Um, Bear in mind that this is not, it's not proof, right? So when you emulate an attacker, it's just an example of what an attacker might do. So you can't prove that you will always catch your attacker, but it's just really good in terms of uh, proving to yourself or others that what you're doing makes sense and uh, has impact. Right, so now let's have a closer look at how, like what do we mean then with attacker emulation? How, how do you put that into practice? Um, so what you would usually do is you would have uh, systems in your estate Usually, you would isolate them from your actual machines. Uh, so, actual machines with you know your base image with all your tools, endpoint tools, whatever. Like basically, what, what a normal machine in your estate would look like in a normal network configuration. And uh, within that uh, representative test environment, 
you would do what an attacker would do. You would uh, try and uh, break stuff. You would try and move laterally. You would create persistence, all that sort of jazz. Um, so the assumption here is that you already have been compromised. This is a post-compromise assumption. So in this test environment, um, you're not going to deal with, you know, trying to infect it. You just assume that has already happened. What you're really interested in is answering like, okay, if an attacker got, gets in, what would it do? Would it move laterally? Would it able to? Um, would it create persistence? Um, that, that's the sort of question you're trying to answer here. So post-compromise in a representative test environment, that is the uh, setting we're, we're dealing in. Um, so then there's a few options you have, um, and that's all different depending on what you're trying to do. So the first one is the manner in which you do attacker emulation. Um, you can do it in a manual way, where you just literally just you know type commands, um, basically mimic an actual attacker, and just see if your detection picks it up, if it uh, maybe prevents it from happening, or if it sh shows up in logs, uh, which is which is great. And if you do it as a one-off thing, that might be the right way for you. What I think is way more interesting is the automated element of it. Um, cause let's face it, we're all cyber people. We're lazy. We don't want to do stuff, right? We want to script it up. We want to do it uh, repeatedly. So the advantage of doing stuff in an automated fashion is that it saves a lot of time. Uh, you can rerun it as often as you want. You can almost use it as a sort of uh, integration test where you run an attack emulation and you just see what happens on various levels, endpoint network, uh, logs, whatever. So um, I'll be focusing on automated, but just bear in mind, maybe for your um, case, manual might be the right answer. Um, then another question is the scope, which is a little bit more tricky. So there's multiple ways of doing attacker emulation. So as I said, you do what an attacker does, blah, 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 we get that. But um, how, how do you do that? So if you, for instance, want to test your um, behavioral uh, detection system, maybe you have separate rules and you just want to test them one by one, almost as a unit test. Uh, so atomic tests will be really good for that. You would, for every rule you have, create an individual action, that, um, maybe like a one-liner with malicious um, behavior. You just see if your um, rule fires and if it does pass and if not fail, right? It's really straightforward. You just run them uh, one after another. You see what rules fires and then they give you an idea of what your defenses are doing. Uh, you could almost uh, script it up as a batch or a batch script, right? It's just literally just run it and you see what happens. Um, it's very simple, very straightforward. Uh, there's also other ways available. So on the other end of the, so atomic is really basic and like one on one. On the other end of the spectrum, you have end to end. So that is where it gets more realistic is end to end. What I mean by that is actually emulating what an attacker will do from the very start till the very end, right? If you follow some sort of kill chain model or whatever is really from the point where you got the initial infection to the point where you execute your final action. I mean, maybe even uh, cover tracks and, and, and remove yourself, that sort of jazz. Um, so I think that's a lot more clever because that means that you don't do individual actions, individual attacks, but you actually use the in and outputs of individual actions for other stuff. For as an example, I might want to test what happens if I run the password dumping tool Mimikatz. You all know who, who knows Mimikatz? And sweet, most of you good. Um, what you would expect. So um, maybe my first test is I'm going to run Mimikatz and see if I detect that. So that could be an atomic action. But to make it more end-to-end, -end, I could say, okay, once I run Mimikatz and this is successful, I'm going to use the output, the credentials I find, to move laterally or create persistence on another system, something like that. So end-to-end -end is you use the in and outputs of other actions, chain them together, link them together in a clever way, and uh, in a way make it more look like what your attacker would leave behind if he was actually in your estate. So two actions. Uh, there's not really a right or a wrong answer here. You can choose for either depending on what you're um, what you're trying to do. So uh, for me, this is what it would look like in terms of usability and ease of use. Uh, sorry, ease of use and usefulness. So Atomic is really easy to do, right? Because you just maybe just a one line or you can script it up. You run it once, you see pass or fail, and then you're done. So it's really relatively easy to use. But for me, usefulness is relatively low. I didn't let the triangle go all the way to the bottom because it's not like... It's not completely useless, but it means um, it, it's very individual actions you're checking rather than a full attack cycle. So you get an idea of what you would pick up, but not like it's going to generate a lot of noise, right? So it's not very representative of what you would normally see. So chained is sort of in the middle where it is still atomic, but it's in an order that you would expect in an attack, but you might not even uh, rely on the in and outputs. It's just still separate actions, just in a in set order. Whereas end to end, and what that will, what that actually means, I will show you in a minute because that's what I will be focusing on, is for me way more useful because it is actual the full attacker lifecycle. However, 
that means that you need to, um, whatever framework you're using, you need to configure that to make sure that it actually links actions together, right? You need to tell it that if I run Mimikatz, I need to pass the credentials somehow and then use their lateral movement somehow. So you need to link them together. And that is not as straightforward as it might look. Um, but as you will see, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be difficult either. Um, great. Okay, so now we have a few parameters here where we can play with. Um, I think end-to-end -end is more interesting. I will show you in a bit why I think it will really help. Um, so there's a few tools available that can help you here. So fortunately, you don't have to do this all yourself. You don't have to start from scratch with a... Um, which might be tempting, right? Sometimes you're like, oh, I can do this in Python. But as you will see, especially end-to-end, -end, it gets really complicated. Uh, so there's a few tools available there that can help you. I'm sure you've all seen this XKCD comic about standards, about, you know, there's, there's 14 standards, and then someone says, oh, that's ridiculous. Like, create one uh, overarching solution, and then you have 15 standards. Great. Um, so that's kind of what happened here. Uh, it's not quite 14, it's 13. But um, this is tools that I found that all claim to do more or less the same thing. And bear in mind, this is just open source and aligned to the attack matrix. So imagine if you do also closed source and not aligned to the attack matrix. There's a lot of option out here. Um, they all do roughly the same. They're all slightly different. So with the parameters I just showed you, in terms of like how atomic or end-to-end -end it is, um, they, they vary a bit. But if you're new to this this sort of uh, thing, uh, attacker emulation, it can be quite overwhelming, right? Like, where, where do you start? What, what are the differences? Is there a, is there a good one and a bad one? Um, I find that quite complex, actually. It requires some time to figure it out. So one of my calls to action would actually be, how great would it be if we just had a few that were really good, rather than um, 13 that all more or less are the same thing? Uh, they're not cross-compatible either. So if you write, if you go for one of these solutions, you might not be able to run it in another. So um, this is a bit of a risk there. So um, yeah, unfortunately, it is like that. So I will focus just on a few that are relatively popular or more lively in the open source um, area. So some of you might have heard of uh, Red Canary's Atomic Red, which is really good. So it's almost like a library of um, actions. So it's uh, aligned to the attack framework. If you've not heard of it, like look it up. It's a really helpful resource to uh, for, for how attackers behave. Um, so they have a really good, on GitHub, a really good uh, open source framework. We have for each, almost, I think almost every attack technique, a really good um, sort of script you can run. Uh, so it, it, it is kind of manual. Um, it's not dynamic either because it's like hard-coded scripts. There's no random file names. It's literally a script you run and you see if um, your detection picks it up. Uh, but it is cross-platform, so it's really good. And it is one of the more lively, one of the more active open source projects. Uh, you might have heard of Uber's Meta, which is automated, which is quite nice. Uh, still not dynamic, it's static scripts, hard-coded file names and whatever, so um, there's some limitations there, but it's also cross-platform. Then we have Caldera, which is uh, from MITRE themselves, so MITRE is the organization behind Attack, and they started it as a research project, I think about one and a half year ago now. So you had Caldera 1.0, which was really cool, um, fully automated and dynamic. It's in Python, I will tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, it's just Windows though. So then, I think about a month ago, they released Caldera 2.0, which contains all the functionality of Caldera 1, but also with the, what they call a chain mode, which is a bit more like what Uber does with Meta. So it's more um, individual actions, hard-coded. So that's why it's like both dynamic and not dynamic. Uh, but the advantage is that it is cross-platform now. So that is really good. Um, then you also have like at, uh, Endgames uh, RTA, Red Team Automation. It's, it's very similar to Caldera, I think. But um, so yeah, there's a few options out there. And uh, there is, again, not necessarily a right answer, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will be focusing on uh, Caldera. Um, oh, yeah, so just to remind you before before we move to Caldera, like, picking the right tool can be tricky, so have to think beforehand what you're trying to do, right? What is your goal? Are you doing this as a one-off thing, or are you going to do this more frequently? Um, that might help you identify if you go for automated or non-automated. What is your scope? Are you literally trying to test individual rules? Or do you want to get like the full life cycle of an attacker? Um, how realistic do you want it to be? Easy to maintain, so that sort of links back to the whole atomic uh, and um, end to end sort of question. So um, have a think and, and find your Eve. So then more about Caldera. Um, as I said, open source research project by MITRE. So it, it, it's a bit researchy, so don't expect flashy user interfaces. But um, as you will see, the the what happens under the hood is really good. So, um, cause there's a lot of stuff you need there that is sort of like outside my area of expertise, but they handle that for you. So that's really good. Um, 
Kubera, if you install it, like without doing anything, it already comes with a lot of uh, attacker actions. For instance, they have a profile for the Lazarus group. So without having to do anything yourself, you can install Caldera on your environment. And if you run it, you can uh, emulate an, a Lazarus group like attacker. So methods they use, you can run on your estate and you can just see with your own detection mechanisms, what would I see? What would I pick up? What would I miss? That in itself already is really helpful. And um, what I will be talking about is how you can extend that and make it um, sort of like adapted to your attacker. So for me, why it sets itself apart from the other um, other ones I just mentioned. So these attacker actions are defined in Python. And while that might not be the best language for this sort of thing, um, like most of my team at least read Python, most of them write Python as well. So it's easier to maintain also going forward. Um, you don't have to get used to any new syntax. It's, it's like a like a accepted language. Um, it works with pre and post conditions. So this is where the whole end-to-end -end thing comes in. And what that will look like, I will show you in a slide or two. Um, which means that Caldera can really cleverly link actions together and make it look like an actual attack. And it does that using the heuristic planner. Um, so that's one of the things that, like, that's, that's really difficult. That's outside my area of expertise. But as long as you do your pre and post conditions, Caldera do all, will do all the difficult stuff. So, um, that's a win-win there. So a very simple setup for Caldera. So just to, for, for you, what it might look like in your environment. So as I said, these are the three hosts at the bottom. They should be representative of machines in your network, your base image, your endpoint tools, network configuration, everything in place as it was like a normal network. You probably want to isolate it, um, as you will see in a minute. And then you have a separate box, the Caldera server, uh, which is almost like a C2 channel server. Um, so it literally sends instructions to the hosts to, you know, move laterally, great persistence, um, dump credentials, um, that sort of thing. So on your estate, you might want to, uh, on your test environment, you might want to infect one of the hosts, because as I said, we, we assume it's already been compromised, right? So you have to install a Caldera agent on at least one of the machines. And from that point on, you can uh, log into the Caldera server and instruct it to you know, run an emulation starting at host A, maybe. And then it will uh, you know, do its persistence, try and move laterally, uh, depending on how you define your attacker. So what would that look like? So imagine in my Caldera instance, I define my attacker and my attacker is able to do these things. So in the interface of a Caldera, I have these um, probably more options available and I've selected for my attacker that it has these capabilities. It can do persistence with run DLL32. It might copy a file remotely. Uh, it can do exfiltration with Git. Why not? Um, it can delete event logs. It can do psexec. It can stage data and it can do mimic cats, right? So, I just tell Caldera that my attacker can do this. And then once you say, okay, start my emulation, um, run it on this host and see what you can do. It will then figure out the most likely path an attacker would take. So again, using pre and post conditions, it will find out, okay, for PS exec, I need credentials. So maybe I should run mimic cats first. And then if that works, I can do PS exec. And once I have PS exec, I can move a file to another host, um, all the way down to uh, delete event logs. So this, figuring this out, this is something Caldera is really good at, as long as you define your pre and post conditions. Um, some stuff is sort of like non-deterministic. So we have the persistence there at the top. Um, it made it the fourth action, but you might as well do it as the fifth or maybe at the start or whatever. Uh, sometimes it doesn't really matter in what order you do stuff, right? So there's also an element of non-determinism there. But again, that is good when you run emulations, because that means that you're, um, you're not over-engineering on this like a single scenario. The more random, I think, the better it is for your detection. Right, so what would, an, um, what would a Caldera class look like? So as I said, um, all your actions are written in Python, um, and they roughly have three sections, each class, in which you define an action. So this is where it gets more sort of like bringing it to life. So roughly the first section is where you define your pre and post conditions. Um, then you have the, the biggest section is obviously where you in Python define what your remote access tool, your RET should do on the infected host. And at the end, uh, you, there's also a cleanup section. So that's, I think another cool feature about Caldera is that, um, once you run it, you will attack your machine, right? So you will create persistence and uh, you will change, you will drop files, you will change registry keys, that sort of jazz. Um, but if you want to run it again, like you don't want to re-image your machine over and over again, right? So Caldera offers you the option to, sort of undo what you changed. 
So if you drop a file, you can then at the end say, well, once you're done, you want to clean up, just delete the file, right? Or if you change your registry key, change it back at the end. Um, but just make sure that um, you can, without having to do anything, rerun your emulation over and over again. So just as an example, so imagine I want to implement a Mimikatz action. Um, so first, I need to define my pre and post conditions. So if you know Mimikatz, you know in order for it to work, you need admin credential. Uh, you need admin rights, right? So my precondition will be if you have admin rights, I can run this. Uh, my post condition will be if this was successful, um, you will have credentials. So you need to tell Caldera in uh, Python in their uh, with using their classes that this is the case. So Caldera then knows uh, how to work together with the other actions. Um, so then the action itself. So that's where you in Python say like, okay, maybe download Mimikatz from this location, uh, run it in PowerShell, uh, do something clever with the outputs, and then um, you also need to tell Caldera what to do. So like, uh, if if you find credentials, you need to tell Caldera in a, in a structured format like these are the credentials, so that further actions know how to access username, password, stuff, and clean up. So if you drop files, or if you maybe in this case, I don't know, create logs or whatever. Um, you can, in your Python class, say, like, okay, delete them at the end to sort of like undo the damage you did. So this is what it would look like. I'm not going to go through it line by line, don't worry. But um, it's also a simplified version. But you can see at the top, you see precondition. It says RET, remote access tool, and it says elevated is true. So my precondition is I need my remote access tool to be elevated in order for this action to be able to run. And then my post conditions are um, I will be aware of users. Right, because Mimikets also gives you usernames, obviously. But more importantly, I will have credentials. And again, post condition assumes it was successful. So precondition, post condition. Then um, the middle bit. So this is the action itself. So you might see here, like literally, it's a it's a URL to a GitHub page with uh, invoke Mimikets.ps1. And then the rule below it, you literally see it running PowerShell with uh, IEX IWR, and then the link. So if you know a little bit of, of PowerShell. You know that IEX is sort of like eval, like the evaluation function. IWR is um, download um, URL to string. So this will literally, if you run this one line, it will literally run mimic hats and dump the output in your standard out. So the advantage of this is that it is fileless, like you don't leave any trace in your, there's no files you need to download because everything happens in memory. It's, it's quite cool. So this is where we prepare it. And then here is telling Caldera's RET to literally run this command line and then do something clever with the output. And then here's step two, um, is literally making Caldera aware of it. So where our post condition is user G and credential G, you now see um, register user G with the found username and register credential G with the found password. Um, so that's like, this is a simplified version, but this is more or less what's going on. And then in this case, there's nothing to clean up, right? Because it won't drop any files. It won't change any registry keys. You don't even need to kill any processes. This is it. So your cleanup is nothing. So this is this one is really simple. Um, this is pretty cool. So you can do this. This is an example for dump credentials. Obviously, you can do this for all sort of thing. So before I move on to showing you and showing you what we did to extend it to make it even more exciting, um, there's a few challenges here, right? So we now know how Caldera works and how you can implement your own stuff. Or even if you don't want to implement stuff, like Caldera already comes with a lot of uh, built-in stuff. There's a few challenges here. So um, once you know your attacker, Making sure that you have all their capabilities in Caldera is, is one of your challenges, right? Making sure that it's actually a good representation of the attacker you're trying to defend yourself against. Another one is a big one is the detection itself. So, uh, in the example I just showed you, you saw that literally the command line contains the word mimic cats, right? So if you really, if you have a really stupid rule based system, you might say, Oh, I know how to de detect mimic cats just by looking at the command line. If I see the word mimic cats, then I found it. Yay. Um, well, that's obviously not what, you, what you're looking for, right? So even though in this emulation, you might have a rule that detects it, you're really looking for the wrong thing, right? What you should be looking for is these weird uh, PowerShell arguments or maybe the DLL uh, PowerShell loads because that would also be um, uh, like different from normal. So um, a challenge here is that even if you implement it, you should make it as random as possible so that you don't detect the wrong thing. Um, the same with like if you have anything artificial intelligence related, like it might pick up that all your evil stuff always contains the word mimic hats or always go to, I don't know, your internal GitHub. Um, that is obviously the wrong thing. That's not what you're after. So that is a challenge. So make sure that once you run it, you detect the right thing. And well, same with realism, right? What techniques do you use? 
um, timing. So in Caldera, you can also set like the interval between individual actions. If you really want to make sure that it is uh, realistic, make sure that you set all these parameters right so um, it, it looks like an actual attack. Sweet. So that was a crash course into normal Caldera. Um, and that is really good. There is um, there is an op open source version of it which you can obviously use. There's people contributing to it, which is pretty cool. What we did is um, extend it even further. So beyond standard Caldera, there's a few things that you see in the wild quite often that you can't do normally. But um, we've changed Caldera to do these things, uh, and I'm going to walk you through them. So there's three things here. We start with law bins or law bass. Um, then we have some very simple obfuscation techniques and also masquerading techniques. Law bins. Who here knows law bins? Uh, okay. Um, so law bins, or sometimes law bass, stands for living of the land binaries, or law bass is living of the land binaries and scripts. Um, what it really is, is uh, tools that are either included in your operating system like Windows, or come with standard software like Microsoft Office, Java, that sort of thing. Um, that are legitimate tools, maybe signed even, uh, that you use to do um, like stuff that's not intended to do. So obvious examples here will be PowerShell is uh, present on every operating system after Windows XP, and you can just write any script you want, right? You can, uh, as, as you saw, you can download files, you can run processes, whatever. So that is a really obvious one. You also got W script and C script for uh, your VB script, MSHDA. That, that's the obvious options. Um, there's also more obscure ones. So if you are familiar with the attack framework, you know that, um, well, sometimes it's looked like half of them, but I, I think it's like a, a quarter, it's, it's law bins. So there are so many Windows processes that you uh, can abuse to do um, stuff that's not meant to do. So a few other examples I just randomly picked. So we got Ragasm, uh, Axe Wizards is quite cool, MS Builds, um, or PubPRN.VWS. So this is an example of a script. Uh, it's a Microsoft signed script that you can trick into executing pretty much whatever you want. So why would you want to do this as an attacker? Well, because you're already in, right? Like, why, why would you need these tools? Um, so it's a way to stay under the radar because it means um, if you are using, for instance, I don't know, MS Build to uh, contact your C2 server, your detection mechanism might think like, oh, I've seen MS Build reaching out to um, to network hosts before. That's That's probably fine, right? Or if you use Ragasm to execute a, uh, a bad command, it might think, oh, it's a Microsoft signed binary, that then whatever it spawns is probably good as well, right? Like, I don't need to worry about that. So um, that's one way. Another way is that some organizations have uh, application-wide listing, so you can only run certain processes. Uh, a common thing to do is just allow Microsoft signed processes, for instance. So imagine if you use Ragasm, I think it's signed, uh, and you trick it into running your evil process, and you can bypass your application whitelisting, right? Because quite often these signed processes are allowed to spawn whatever they want. Right, so law bins. So how do you do this in Caldera? So for Caldera to understand it, you again need to think about pre and post conditions. So a precondition would be, in order to run a law bin, I need to know a command that I want to run, right? So that's your precondition. Your post condition will be, if my law bin was successful, uh, the command will have executed. So, simple example. So, if I'm on a machine and I want to run my evil.exe um, binary, uh, and I want to stay under the radar, um, I will pick a random law bin. So, in this example, I chose ragasm with the slash u parameter. Um, so, that requires you to compile a custom DLL. So, that will be the action. And then the post condition will be, well, it ran successfully. So, as you can... Sweet. So as you can see here on the slide, so this is what it might look like if you run it in Caldera. So you have the command.exe process here, which is Caldera's process where it sort of like runs all the all the crap from really. Um, then you see it spawning Ragasm, so system32 binary, and you see it here calling it uh, with this parameter Adobe updated.dll. So I don't know about you, but I've seen Adobe doing weirder things. So if I see something like this, I'll be like, yeah, might be a bit, might, might be legit actually. Um, but obviously in this example, it's, it's evil. So this is a compiled DLL that will um, trick Ragasm into executing my temp um, process called evil. So uh, this is what it might look like. So it's a very good way to stay under the radar or avoid um, application uh, bypassing. Right, so that's one. So what that will look like in practice, I will show in the, in the, in the demo after this. So then obfuscation. The principle is really simple. Like it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, a lot of rule-based systems 
look for keywords, right? So you might say, in the example I showed you, um, if I see PowerShell and I see it running a command line that contains IEX, that is weird. I don't want that. Um, so a lot of systems, if you're looking for behavioral stuff, rely on keywords. So what if you try and hide these keywords with, um, with, with there's various ways of doing it. So there's another resource. So um, presentation will be available at the end, by the way. Um, both the slides and all the code I've shown you, the implementation in Caldera, will be on my GitHub, um, including all the references you see in the presentation. So if you're interested in obfuscation, it's a really good resource there. Um, but a few simple examples are, imagine you are looking for the keyword, hello world. Um, one simple way of doing that is just um, cutting the string up in pieces. So here you see hello world and it's now three pieces and um, my detection mechanism won't detect hello world anymore because it's interrupted with these annoying quotes and plus signs. So um, that's one way of doing it. Another simple way is escaping it. So in PowerShell, the escape character is a backtick. So um, you just escape a few characters that don't need escaping. PowerShell will still understand it, but your rule-based detection mechanism might miss it. Format string, also quite nice. So um, basically, it allows you to reorder um, a string in a, in, a, in a random order, making it both hard to look um, at for humans, since it's harder to read what it says now, right? Um, but also for machines, like it might miss the actual keyword it's looking for. Base64 encodes also low-hanging fruit. Like you would be surprised how easy it is to run Base64 encoded commands. And a lot of systems don't um, detect it and unencode it. So again, if you're looking for certain commands, if you just base64 encode it, you might completely miss it. Um, so just to remind you, this is just um, simple stuff for really stupid systems. If you have more clever stuff, um, like entropy analysis will reveal this is doing something weird, right? Because normal commands won't have as many quotes or plus signs or backticks. Um, so there are obviously other ways to detect it. But it's just a really nice way. You will see in practice a lot of attackers, you'll still try it even if uh, they get detected. It's just maybe your uh, detection will miss it. So what will that look like in Caldera? So again, precondition, postcondition. So my precondition is I need a command. So this is our mimicast command again, IEX, IEW, and then this whole uh, GitHub URL. So now we implemented this obfuscation. It will randomly pick one of the ones I just mentioned. So in this case, it chose um, format string. So, well, good luck understanding what it says here, right? Like if you don't see this, you just see that. You can tell something weird is going on. But if you're looking for the word Mimikatz, like it's now in three separate pieces, right? So I think it's like 44 strings of four characters. So um, it make it more difficult to, um, if you and it actually works. If you run this one, it will actually, I checked it, it will actually run Mimikatz. Um, this is a lot harder to detect. Although, as I said, if you have um, entropy analysis or something of the likes, um, you'll still detect it. And hopefully you will still do other cleverer ways of detecting it anyway. But this is just a good way to check, like, does your system actually go beyond normal keyword checking? Then finally, masquerading. Um, this is something we saw more recently. And again, when you think about it, it's quite simple. So um, you take a legitimate utility, like PowerShell, a WScript, whatever. Um, you put it in a temp folder. You call it something else and um, profit. So. Imagine in the example I gave you, you have a rule that says, I'm looking for PowerShell uh, in combination with IEX in the command line. What if I call it definitely not PowerShell.exe and put it in a temp folder and I run the same command? It will still work, right? But will your rule-based uh, detection system still detect it? Because it's not called PowerShell anymore, right? Um, or what about this browser, the second one? Does anyone recognize the icon? It's, 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 uh, I think it's C-script uh, or W-script, one of the two. Um, but if I call it SVC host and I put it in temp, uh, there might be a lot of, like, even like if you look at it with a human eye, you might think, yeah, could be. Um, so what would that look like in an attack? So imagine I want to run the command w script slash ej script uh, evil.js. If I run this like that, it might get detected very easily because this is not like a normal way of using w script. But with our implementation in Caldera, it will just randomize the name. It will copy it to a temp folder, give it a random name, but sort of legit sounding. So in this case, uh, it shows googleupdate.exe. Um, and now instead of running W scripts, it will run Google Update. And because it's a copy of the binary, it will still work as expected, um, but it looks a lot less suspicious, right? So again, if this is your... Um, so we saw this actually being used for persistence. So imagine you have an auto-run entry that is called c slash window slash temp slash google update dot xe and with this parameters. Maybe you wouldn't call it evil.js, but imagine it's called like uh, acceptula.js. If you see this in your auto run entries, you might think, oh, 
I've seen Google run from temp before. And yeah, that's something that Google might do. So um, it's actually running W script. And um, if you use an AV, it will tell you like, oh, actually, it's a trusted Microsoft process and there's zero detection. So nothing going on here. Um, so this is just a really easy way to bypass systems that don't go the extra mile, that just look at the superficial things. So uh, again, we extended Caldera to do this stuff, a randomized file name. Um, and this is what it might, might look like in your process tree. Are we doing time-wise? I think we're doing well. Right, so putting it into context. So um, what I did for a demo is that I created an attacker, which is some random capabilities, and um, I ran it. And it will use masquerading, obfuscation, and law bins. And um, just to give you an idea of what that would look like and what it would look like on your estate. So um, for this attack, you obviously infect, uh, you obviously assume that you've been infected. So stage zero is outside of scope. Um, so maybe then my attacker does some discovery techniques, some lateral movement. Um, maybe we'll do some execution then. Uh, maybe use that to create persistence to stay on the network. And at the end, uh, cover tracks. And that's between brackets because Caldera out of the box supports undoing what you do, right? So the cover tracks is sort of covered by that. So imagine we have this. So in the discovery and lateral movement phase, it can run Mimikatz, it can find administrators, it can find other machines on the same network, it can move to other machines. Um, it's a good start, right? So this is what I defined in Caldera. This is what my attacker can do. For execution, so this is where the more um, sort of like interesting stuff comes because this is stuff we implemented ourselves. It can download a web server, uh, but also set up a web shell using that download. Uh, and maybe it can exfiltrate data using the web shell uh, if it was successful. Um, maybe then with persistence, it can create an auto run entry for the web shell so that it can uh, even survive a reboot and uh, can still do exfiltration or send it malicious commands. And as I said, cover tracks, right? Caldera at the end will um, clear all files, registry keys, whatever, as long as you define it in your Caldera action. Right, demo time. Um, so just before I start the clip, um, so we have here on the left-hand side the interface of Caldera. So it's Caldera 2.0. You will see initially gray boxes are popping up. And then if they were successful, they turn green. If they were unsuccessful, they turn red. Um, then on the right-hand side here, you see the Uvictim machine. So I have just one machine to keep it simple. Um, at the bottom here, you see the temp folder. So this is where Caldera will drop a lot of files. So just so you can see what's going on. And then here I have Process Explorer. So at the top, you see cagent.exe, which is the surface that runs a Caldera. You will see that it will spawn Commander, and then you'll see all the commands that uh, Caldera will run to emulate your attack. Um, I have a magnified version at the top because it's quite small, so hopefully you guys at the back can see it. So uh, this is the more interesting bit, and I will describe what's happening here. Um, so let's start. So as I said, the first thing it will do is it will create Commander.exe. So um, and now here it's starting. So now it's here it says running Mimikatz. So let's pause here. So what you can see now is that it's um, decided to run the example I gave you with the IEX, IEW, and then the whole GitHub URL. But um, it, it kind of falls off the page. But as you can see here, it's using format string. So you have the full version here. It cut up the, the string into, I think, 10 different parts. And uh, it gave it to PowerShell. So this is one of the techniques, right? This is the, um, the um, obfuscation technique. Hopefully, this box will turn green, meaning that it was successful. So it's now running. And it's fileless, so you don't see anything here, right? But hopefully, this one turned green. And if you look here, it currently says zero credentials. But if this was successful, it now says 13 credentials. So that works. So we have credentials, so we can move laterally. That's cool. So as I said, Caldera is non-deterministic. So it now decided to enumerate all the computers in the domain. Could have done that as the first action, right? But it doesn't really matter. Um, right, okay, so now it decided to start downloading the web server, um, and it decided to use a law bin for that, so it decided to use certutil, which is a binary that is, I think, present on pretty much every Windows operating system since Windows XP, um, which has a weird vulnerability that you can make a trick to downloading any file you want. So you can see here certutil, and if you look here, you can actually see it going to a URL where it downloads a binary, and if that was successful, you can now see the zip file here, we randomize the name, again, to make sure that my detection system doesn't like just look at the file name, but really looks at the behavior. Right, so box turned green, we got the web server now. So again, non-determinism, it decided now to uh, enumerate admin groups. 
So it's using PowerShell for that. And if you look at the um, command line, you will see that it, there's nothing on the command. No, it doesn't show it now. There's nothing on the command line here. So it uses the standard in. So if you just look at command lines, you won't see any malicious behavior. This is literally putting the commands in the standard in. And again, it's fileless, so you won't, you won't see anything here. So we give that a few more seconds, and then hopefully we can move on to the next one. Okay, so that is finished. Right. Okay, so now we decided to create persistence. So um, I think this one actually runs inside Caldera, so you don't actually see any processes, nor do you see any files dropped. Right, so now this new box is gray. It says down launching web server using run DLL32. So this is not a law bin. So it realized that it has a downloaded version of this um, web server. And what you can see here, it might be a bit small. So it, there's now a process here that says update daemon. And if you recognize the icon, this is the icon for run DLL uh, 32. And you can see it also dropped a random file here, an SCT script uh, with, a random, uh, with a random file name. So what it will do now is use another law bin uh, with run DLL 32 to ex extract the zip file into a folder here and then run the web server. So let's see if that works. So as you can see, you can see a new folder here, random file name, box turned green, so we know it was successful. So now it actually trying to set up the web shell. Oh, I think it was really quick, but you, um, let me see if I can get that back. Right, so you can see here, uh, my commander process spawns PowerShell and then spawns this process called USB web server, which spawns Apache uh, binaries from my temp folder and Caldera actually checks if it can reach out to this web server. It uses a really dodgy PHP script to just execute random commands. And they can then check if it ex uh, is able to exfiltrate information. So the box turned green so we know that was successful but as you saw that happened in like two seconds. It was really really quick. Right this is the final stage. So it now tries to move laterally so it creates a share on another host that it found using one of the other actions and then it copies the Caldera process to the other hosts, uh, which was also successful. So um, that's where it stops. So it now goes to the cleanup phase. And as you will see here, all the files that were created will now disappear in a matter of time. There we go. So um, that was it. So this is how you can, in Caldera, emulate it. And this is what it will look like on your Victor machine. So I just have this next slide just for reference. I'm not going to go through it, uh, this one. Um, where I go through like all the actions and sort of like how, which actions rely on others and what techniques were used, right? So we saw obfuscation, standard in, law bin, more law bin, um, we saw masquerading. Um, so yeah, have, have a look at this at home if you want to, but just to remind you that this is just not random tests, just firing random commands, but it's actually relying, it, it, it's actually, it thought about the order and it also relies on past actions, right? So this one can only run if action four was successful and four can only run if three was successful. So. Um, pretty cool stuff, I think. But as I said, um, this is just a start, right? So now you have successfully emulated an attacker. You have um, done what an attacker would do. But the challenge is, did you detect it, right? Did you, in this case, it didn't stop it, right? Because it was successful. But can you detect it at least? So um, this is an example of what that might look like in your anal analytics platforms. This is mine. So the challenge now is to see what did I, what did I find? Um, what did I miss? Can I improve it somehow? So the example I gave with the file names, like maybe you see that you're detecting the wrong thing, but can I improve it? So um, it really starts now only. So this is all cool stuff. And as I said, you can, um, I will be sharing the code, so you can pretty much do this yourself by installing it. But um, the, the big question is, what did you see? Right, so I'm gonna wrap up. So uh, attacker emulation going forward. So I showed you a lot of cool stuff and for me, I think my, my, my vision will be that um, a lot more people should look into this, but not only look into it, but only also share their work. So uh, to set an example, I will be sharing my code, but I really hope that uh, other people, whatever solution you're using, whether that's Caldera or one of the others, um, that you share what you're doing so other people can use it and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, it would be great if you had like modules you can share just like Matt has plugged, and people could just sort of plug in and with these clever pre and post conditions, you can just, with minimal effort, emulate specific attackers, right? Imagine you could download like an APT, I don't know, one, two, three profile. You can run it and just within seconds see what you can detect. I thought, I, th I think it would be amazing. Um, and the industry standard idea, so um, these tools are not cross tool uh, compatible. So it would be nice if you somehow could come up with a profile that all, all tools can accept and you can just choose whatever tool you like. 
Um, before I go to my final slide, just, just a reminder, as I said, um, it's great. It can help you a lot, but it's not a silver bullet. Um, it's going to help you see that what you're doing has an impact, but it's not proof by no means, right? Uh, it's just an, for yourself to see what you're doing makes sense. It's maybe to tell others that what you're doing actually has an impact, but it's not going to, um, it is, this is not like a universal solution to everything. So um, I think this is my penultimate slide. So key takeaways, I really hope when you're back home, you think like, what was this weird guy rambling on about in the morning? So four things. Attack emulation helps you not just understand uh, the threats you're facing, but also your defenses. Are you really looking for the right thing? Um, if you do attack emulation, do it the right way, right? Make it as random as possible, make it as real as possible, so you can have actual results that give a good idea of your uh, the status of your defenses. It doesn't have to be difficult because all the stuff I showed you is what I did, but you can just reuse that. You don't have to do it yourself. So it doesn't have to be difficult. Um, and as I said, community-based sharing. I really hope that um, some of you are inspired and that you'll all be uh, sharing your work so we can all um, see what, you, uh, what you're doing. So both the slides and the code can be found on my GitHub page, github.com slash um, Any feedback or whatever, please follow me on Twitter, um, shoot me a message or send me an email. Uh, but you can also just find me during the break and uh, and have a chat. Thank you.